morning. Dobo Yutro. Um, today, we're going to talk about blockchains, which I think are one of the most overhyped, but also potentially most useful technologies of the modern era. And I think that a topic that I'm seeing a lot more, at least in the work that I do, is whether and how to use blockchains in your own applications. What's the right fit for them? Should they be used? And maybe even what are they? And how should you understand them? So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. I think even if you're not planning on putting them inside your applications or you don't have any specific use cases, I think you might still find it valuable to understand what they are and how they're put together. And so that's what we'll talk about today. I work for a, um, a company called Pivotal. And Pivotal's job is to help enterprises transform the way the world builds software. So that means that I intersect with a lot of companies that are trying to do a better job of that. Um, if you have questions during the talk, one logistical note, I would appreciate it if you could respond to the tweet that I just made that, so we can collect all those questions in a thread, because it's really difficult to see people up here on the stage, and I, I'm going to have trouble picking people out. So that way, we'll get to uh, all the questions that we can. All right, so the super short version of this talk is that you probably shouldn't use a blockchain in your application. For most applications, it doesn't really make sense to use a blockchain. For most of the time, for most applications, a blockchain is either not going to get you anything at all, or it's going to be objectively worse than just doing uh, a database. So we'll come back to that later, though. So what are blockchains, and why might they be useful to some applications? Well, way back in Halloween 2008, someone, we, we still don't know who, uh, someone who used the name Satoshi Nakamoto posted to a very obscure cryptography-related email list a, a white paper that he had written about a new idea that he was calling Bitcoin. And it, at the time, it didn't really make much of a splash. It was kind of overlooked. And it wasn't until several months later when Satoshi Nakamoto put a piece of software out on that list to uh, sort of implement the ideas that he had described, in, or he or she or they, uh, they, they published this additional piece of software that was the original Bitcoin client that implemented the ideas that were in the paper. And that's when people started to pay a little bit of attention. And the paper lays out a few different ideas. First, it talks about this purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, cash that's, that's digital, doesn't have any kind of physical manifestations, is only, uh, only exists in the digital realm. And this cash is secured with digital signatures. So unlike paper money, where you can only trust it because you know it wasn't forged, or you, know, you hold it up to the light and you see a security strip or a hologram or whatever, the only way that you, the way that you trust this money is that it's digitally signed. Uh, and in particular, he described a solution to a very specific, or he or she or they, described a solution to a very specific problem called the double spending problem. And it turns out that if you want any kind of fidelity with your electronic cash, you need to solve the double spending problem. And the way that he solved, he or she or they, the way they solved this problem was with something called a hash-based proof of work. And we'll come back to that later, but that's basically the crux of how this works. And in particular, the solution is going to be resistant to attack. It will be resistant to forgery. It will be resistant to cheating because of this idea of having the longest chain the lo the, that, that represents the most amount of work that's been done. And that's the one that you should trust. And this is the, together, these concepts form what are called the blockchain. And we'll kind of explore each of those in more detail. But first, it might be helpful to think about what a world without money would look like. If you wanted to make a transaction in such a world, what would that look like? Well, imagine we have two parties, as we would for any transaction, one whom we'll call Alice. And Alice would like a piece of cake. And she doesn't have a piece of cake, but she knows about her friend Bob, the baker, who is really skilled at baking pieces of cake. And Bob is always late for meetings, so Bob would love to have a watch or a timepiece of some kind. And it turns out that Alice has a timepiece, and Bob knows how to bake pieces of cake. So Alice and Bob can swap the things that they have for the things that they want, and each person will wind up happier than they were before. So a, a transaction has been conducted here. Now, what would a failed transaction look like? That might be something like this, where they both want the same things, but they don't have the right things to give to the other person. In this case, Bob still wants that watch, 
but Alice doesn't have a watch. Alice only has her pet snail. So here a transaction will not occur because the two parties don't want to trade. How would you fix a failed transaction? Well, one way of doing that is to introduce a third party who we'll call Carol, who does have the thing that Bob wants and wants the thing that Alice has. So we can sort of intermediate between the two parties by introducing this third party. And again, we can conduct a transaction between all three parties to, uh, to make the transaction happen. But notice that this is just a coincidence. It's just coincidental that this worked because we happened to find an Alice for which it was true that uh, all of the, everything lined up for this transaction. And economists call this situation a double coincidence of wants. That is, it's just a coincidence without money. It's just a coincidence that you have something that another person wants. Alice might have a watch, but that doesn't mean that the person who has the thing that she wants also wants a watch. It's just a coincidence that that happens to be true. So that means that if you want something, you might have to try a lot of people who, can, who have the thing that you want before you get something. So you might have to try, if you want a piece of cake, it might be the case that there are a lot of bakers, but maybe only one or two of them actually want to watch. So that's a lot of work. And so money is one way of fixing this problem. Now, I think when you ask developers about money, they have a notion of money that looks like this, where it's this sort of this data structure that has uh, a currency and a, an amount of that currency. So like 100 euros or $200 or 300 francs or whatever. And I think that's not quite really what money is. It's not sufficient to capture the behavior of money. That's just a data structure. There's no behavior there. And I think to think about what, how money behaves, it's useful to think about what isn't money. So maybe an example of something we could agree isn't money is a steak dinner. And the reason a steak dinner isn't money is that it doesn't satisfy certain properties that economists say money needs to have. The first property is something called disintermediation. Does it solve the double coincidence of wants? Will it replace the carol in this situation? Will people be willing to accept that money instead of requiring exactly the things uh, that you want to barter for. If you can use the money in the future to exchange for goods and services, then you'll be better off than you were before. Uh, the money needs to be fungible. So that is, the money needs to be able to be treated equally. One euro is the same as another euro, but one steak dinner might not be the same as another steak dinner. The steak dinner that I make might not be the same as the steak dinner that a three-star Michelin chef makes. The money has to be resilient. It has to hold its value over time. A steak dinner that's three days old probably isn't worth as much as a steak dinner that's right off the grill. So that's not a very resilient form of money. Paper money sticks around for years and decades and maybe even longer if it's metal. So that, that has a different level of resiliency to it. Uh, and finally, the money also has to be measurable. So we have to we have to be able to agree on the value of that steak dinner. So it's gonna be difficult for us to agree about what the value is. Maybe some of us are vegan, maybe some of us just don't like meat as much. So we're all gonna have different assessments of how much that's worth. And then finally, um, people don't necessarily wanna get paid back in steak dinners. If you do someone a favor and they expect you to pay them back, they might be fine with taking money, but would they be fine with taking steak dinners? Probably not. If you you know, if you go take out a mortgage to buy a house, um, is the bank gonna be okay getting paid back in 400,000 steak dinners? Probably not. So for all these reasons, steak dinners are not a good form of money. So can we do better than steak dinners for money? People who are advocates of something called fiat currency think so. Fiat is a Latin word that means it shall be. And this is where the state or government or an institution of some kind, like a central bank, produces the money and it does so just because it can. And here, if you use paper money, that money has all of those properties. It certainly has them in a higher degree than steak dinners. So now if we can do transactions with money, we have a really different experience than we did before because now Alice doesn't need to have the thing that Bob wants. Bob will be willing to accept either the thing that he wants, which is in this, in this case is a watch, or he'll take the money because he knows that later he can take that money and spend it to buy a watch himself. If that wasn't true, then he doesn't really trust the money that much. So here we can conclude this transaction just like we did before and everybody's happier. But notice that there's something different about the money than, than before. Before Bob just got the thing that he wanted, he can just get a watch and now he's happy. 
But here he is going to take that money with the assumption that later on he can go buy that watch. So in effect, Bob is trusting the government or the institution that's printing that money to be able to exchange his money for goods and services later on. And that's not, you know, that's not always true. Uh, governments institute capital controls. Governments set rules about what you can or can't do with the money. You know, if you're an arms dealer, your money might get frozen in a bank account and then you can't spend it, right? You, you broke the law and you, the government has said, well, you, those dollars might be yours or those euros might be yours, but we're not gonna let you use them because you broke the law. So you're agreeing effectively to certain kinds of rules when you use money or, or when you use fiat currency, I should say. So we can think about money as being a kind of a recipe uh, that's different from what we had before. And this recipe has three ingredients, trust, rules, and history. Trust means how do we know that the currency is genuine and that it represents what it says it does? Uh, rules are what are the rules about how we can exchange money with each other, what we can do with it, what we're permitted or not permitted to do with it, and so on. And then finally, with the history tells us how will we record what happened with this money? What are the transactions we've made with each other? Because if we don't write down the transactions we've had, then we might disagree about whether or not something took place at all. So the way that we might fill this out for fiat currencies, we might say, okay, well, the trust comes from an institution, from a government or from a, a state of some kind or from something that is imbued with the power of the state. The rules come from laws, uh, so regulations and uh, and uh, other, other rules that are codified into law about what you can or can't do with the money. And then the history is persisted, at least in modern times, it's persisted with central banks or with uh, a network of banks that record all your transactions. So when you swipe your credit card um, or when you pay with cash at a store, you are effectively, ultimately that transaction is getting recorded in a bank somewhere. So even if you pay with cash, eventually the store is going to deposit that money into a bank. So some record of that transaction will exist there. So the collection of these things is one way to get money. But importantly, the details about how to use this money are completely abstracted from users. Do you need to know how central banking works to go and spend your money to buy a sandwich? No, you can just go into a store and buy the sandwich. Do you need to know how the network of banks talks to each other and communicates files uh, with everybody's records of transactions in order to spend money to buy some ice cream? No, you can just buy whatever you want. You don't have to know anything about how the money works in order to use it as long as you have it. So can we do better than that? Can we give people a better experience than that? Well, Satoshi's idea was, well, if we had a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, you wouldn't need to trust that institution. So you wouldn't, need the, you wouldn't need to fill out the trust part of this recipe with faith in an institution of some kind. So people who are advocates of cryptocurrency think that there's a better way to fill out this recipe. They think that the way that you fill out this recipe is, well, the trust should actually come from math, from faith in digital signatures like Satoshi talked about. And we'll talk about that later. The rules come from software that describes the protocol of how you are and are not allowed to use the currency, the cryptocurrency that we're talking about. And then finally, the history comes from something called the blockchain. The blockchain is a record of all of the transactions, of all of the things that have ever happened with respect to this cryptocurrency. Now, notice that the blockchain is just a data structure. You know, so people getting excited about blockchains in and of itself, that's only one part of this recipe. That's not the whole story. So getting excited about blockchains is like getting excited about link lists or B trees or whatever, right? Like it's just a data structure that happens to have some interesting properties, but it's not enough to give you a cryptocurrency because really I think the most important part is that middle part, the rules, the software that describes what you can and can't do with the, uh, what you can and can't do with the cryptocurrency, what will or won't be recorded on the blockchain, what kinds of data gets stored there, what are the rules about that, and so on and so forth. So I think it's really actually the rules that are the most interesting part. And importantly, if you change any one of these things, you have a completely different cryptocurrency. You know, in the same way that if you change the institution that you're trusting, if you're talking about euros versus dollars, you're not talking about the same currency anymore. Likewise, if you change the block, if somebody changes the rules about a cryptocurrency, that's a completely different cryptocurrency than before. Somebody has changed the rules about what is or is not permitted. So again, the collection of these three things makes a form of money. Now, 
With cryptocurrency, are those details abstracted from users? I would say right now, no. If you want to buy and sell Bitcoin, you can do that pretty easily. Same for Ethereum, same for like the top 10 cryptocurrencies. But if you want to spend that money to buy something, eh, that's a little harder. Is your landlord going to accept Bitcoin in exchange for the rent? Uh, can you buy a sandwich with Bitcoin? Can you, you know, can you do all the things that you'd like to do with money with cryptocurrency? You can certainly do some of them, but it's a lot harder and it's a lot easier to mess up in such a way that you've either lost all your money or sent it to the wrong location in, an ir in a way that makes it possible not for it to ever get retrieved again and so on. So I would say these details are not really abstracted from users right now. So again, each, each currency's rules and history are what make it unique, but the blockchain as history, I think, is not very interesting. It's just a record of what happened, and it's really the rules about how that record is put together that are interesting. It's the software that you write uh, for your clients or for, for whatever distributed application you're talking about that determines whether or not that, uh, that those the, the records that are on the blockchain are valid for your cryptocurrency. And that's, I think, the really interesting part. So when you're deciding about, when you're deciding what or whether to put things together for a distributed application, the first question is really, what are you gonna put on that blockchain? Because you have to define that, you have to say, what are the interesting things that I'm putting together? Why are people using this as opposed to just the database? So ultimately, we're talking about a really different kind of money because the things on the top look really different than the things on the bottom. So you might ask, is it so different that it's not really money at all, or maybe it's something that looks really different than money? We'll come back to that point. So let's just build a cryptocurrency from scratch and see what happens. So before we saw that money looks something like this, so this is the developer conception of money. This is the, you know, I, I downloaded a money object for, uh, from my standard library and I'm using it in my application kind of money. So there's no behavior here, it was just data structures. And I think, again, that's not really sufficient to capture the behavior side of money like we talked about, the rules that govern how that money should work. And one way to think about an improvement on this from the cryptocurrency perspective is to think about the idea with ledgers. Let's imagine that we have three people who we'll call Alice, Bob, and Carol. And Alice, Bob, and Carol are all roommates. And we'll refer to them as A, B, and C from here on out on the slides so we don't have to keep cluttering things up. So Alice, Bob, and Carol are all roommates, and they buy each other beer once in a while. They uh, swap the utilities and the rent, and they're kind of handing over cash every once in a while. So Alice will pay Carol $15, for example. But all of that shuffling of cash is cumbersome. You have to keep handing over physical pieces of paper. Could we do better? Well, one way to do better is if we ask each of Alice, Bob, and Carol to contribute an amount equal to, let's say, what they would spend in a week with each other into a shared pot. So they're each gonna contribute, let's say, $100 into this shared collection of money. And that's going to be the basis of our ledger. So there's, there's gonna be a, a, a bucket somewhere with $300 in it. And our ledger is going to record the transactions that Alice, Bob, and Carol make on the ledger. And specifically, our ledger doesn't run out of room. So even if, uh, so we're gonna have like a whiteboard on the refrigerator and we're just gonna write the transactions down there. But if we run out of room, we're just gonna keep stapling more whiteboards to the bottom of the, uh, to the, bottom of the fridge. So we're never gonna run out of room on this ledger. So the first few lines of this ledger would say things like, Alice got 100 bucks because they contributed that to the shared pot. So did Bob and so did Carol. So we all contributed that $100 and we all got credit for it on the ledger. Now, when Alice wants to pay somebody else, she does so not with cash, but by adding a record to the ledger of that transaction. So we're gonna have a protocol that describes what kinds of things are and are not permitted for this ledger. So the first rule of our protocol is gonna be, hey, if you wanna make a transaction, anybody can add a valid line to the ledger. And a valid line consists of the person, you're, uh, the person who has the money and the person who's receiving the money and then the amount of the money, and that's it. So instead of handing over that cash to Errol, uh, to, to Carol rather, Alice is just going to write a new line on a ledger. Now what about if we have really big transactions? So what if Alice wants to pay Carol $1,500? She doesn't have $1,500, she just has $100 that she originally contributed in the ledger. So this is a form of overspending. Alice doesn't actually have this money. So we might say, okay, well if you're in debt, if you've overspent, that's fine, but just make sure that you settle up at the end of the week. So make sure that you get back to a zero balance if you're negative by contributing more money to the shared pot. The problem with this is that what if Alice doesn't pay back? So what if Carol says, 
where's my $1,500, please? And Alice can just say, sorry, I'm not gonna give you the $1,500, I and mean, Carol is mad and won't trust this ledger anymore. So we're gonna say that we need another rule, which is no overspending. You can't overspend. You can only spend money you already have. At the moment that we've added that second rule, with those two rules, we've made our own currency, not our own cryptocurrency, but our own currency. And the reason for that is, if everybody else in the world only used this ledger to add transactions with each other, and they would never have to swap physical currency again. If, in effect, we've completely divorced this world from the rest of the world that's using paper currency. Now, if only three people are using this, that's not super useful, but it's at least useful for transactions between the three of them. But if 100,000 people are using this, then that's maybe a little bit more useful, right? So the more people that use it, the more valuable it is, which is sort of the, uh, an important point you're thinking about distributed applications. If a small number of people use it, it may not be as valuable uh, to have a blockchain. So that ledger can grow over time, and now it's really denominated in something that isn't dollars or euros or a currency anymore, it's its own currency. So we're gonna call it lockbox from now on. So instead of dollars or euros, the currency that's represented by the ledger is a lockbox. Now, there's a really big problem, which is that we can't really trust this ledger. It's just people writing stuff on a whiteboard right now. So that means that Bob might get an idea in his head and say, hmm, wait a minute, anybody can add lines to this ledger, so I can just add a line that says that somebody else paid me some money, and then I'll be richer than before. Even though that transaction never actually was authorized, it doesn't matter because you can't prove that Carol didn't write that transaction. So we can't really trust this ledger for two reasons. We, uh, people can add lines that aren't valid, and people can remove lines that are valid. So we need to solve these two problems before people will be able to trust this ledger. So the first problem is how do we stop forgery? So we need to be able to secure this ledger. And Satoshi gave us an idea in the original paper. He said digital, solution, digital signatures are part of the solution. So here's how that might work. You've got those three transactions. You've got, say, three transactions on the ledger right now. Now, in order for these transactions to be valid, we can require that people sign. Uh, whoever authorized the transaction should be the one who signs their name. Now, this is a physical whiteboard with a physical uh, you know, signature on it and physical signatures can be copied or forged. So it turns out that you know Bob can just get really good at forging Alice's signature, and then we're kind of back to where we started. So the physical signature didn't really add that much. What we could do instead is use digital signatures. And in order to use digital signatures, we're gonna need to invent two methods, two operations. One operation will be called sign, and the sign operation will take a line that we want to authorize and sign it. And then with the verify operation, we'll be able to take a line that someone else signed and see if it was really them who signed it. So for example, let's say, uh, the way, and the way this is gonna work is we're gonna ask each person who participates in this ledger to generate two keys, a public key and a private key, just like you would for uh, SSH authorization, for example. So the public key and the private key are mathematically related in a way that we won't describe here, but just know that they're sort of connected. The public key is something you advertise to everybody, and the private key is something you keep secret, like a password. And we're gonna call it a secret key here, just so we don't have two things that start with the letters PK. So the public key and secret key. Now the way that you sign transactions is you're gonna take the message that you'd like to sign, in this case, the transaction that says, Alice paid Carol 15 lock bucks, that's the thing you wanna sign. You're gonna sign that with your secret key, the password, the thing that only you know. And because only you know it, only you will be able to generate valid signatures for things that you say are yours. So this, that sign operation is going to produce a signature, and that signature is basically just a long list of, of bits, uh, of, uh, of binary digits. And importantly, small changes in the message produce large and unpredictable changes in the signature. That means that it's difficult to forge the signature because you don't know what a valid signature will be for a message without knowing both the message that you want to forge and the secret key. And since the secret key is secret, since only you know that, that means that Bob or Carol or someone else can't make a signature if it isn't yours. So if you want to verify that that signature was actually signed by you, you take the signature and you take the, um, the message that you signed and take the public key, and then you combine that with the message and the signature, and then you'll get an answer that says, yes, this message was signed by this person, or no, this message was not signed by that person. Now, importantly, it's really easy to generate a signature, but it's really hard 
given a signature to generate the message and the secret key that it was associated with, and it's virtually impossible to do that. And it's not only virtually impossible, it's what cryptographers call computationally infeasible. That is, it's not strictly impossible, but the only way to get the answer is by trying every possible combination until you find the right one. And that takes so much time and so much effort that you're gonna give up long before you find the right answer. So we're gonna require that people sign those lines to be valid. So now, now when Bob tries to forge that record, he won't be able to forge it because he doesn't know Alice's secret key, so he can't produce a valid signature. So we can't forge lines anymore, but Bob is really clever, and what he notices is that he can just find some transaction in which he was paid that's legitimate, and then simply copy that transaction again. It has the same signature, so it's totally valid to do that. So now Bob is better off than he was before, but he's cheating the network. So you can duplicate legitimate lines even if they were unauthorized. So to fix this, we're gonna make one modification, which is that you have to add some kind of unique identifier to the message, like a timestamp or an auto-incrementing integer or whatever. So this prevents the message from being unique for each, or uh, sorry, prevents the message from being able to be copied. It prevents a kind of attack called the replay attack. So now we can simply add more lines to this ledger without having to worry that Bob is going to be able to forge new records. So we're gonna require it again, lines have unique identifiers. There's one final problem though, which is that the ledger is centralized. We have to trust the central location, this whiteboard that has everybody's stuff on it. So it'd be better if we could distribute the ledger instead. So how might that work? Let's say we have Alice, Bob, and Carol again, and we're gonna give each of them their own copy of the ledger, and every time they wanna make an update to the ledger, we're going to broadcast that to everybody else in the network, everybody else who also has that ledger. So let's say that Bob wants to add a line to the ledger, for example. So he's gonna send that update to everybody else in the network, in this case, Alice and Carol, and he's going to say, hey, please add this transaction to your ledger. You don't have to trust the central location, you just have to trust your own ledger at this point. So now we've found a way to distribute the ledger, but we haven't solved a very particular problem, the double spending problem. If Alice broadcasts two different transactions at the same time, Bob knows that Alice can only afford one of these transactions. So he has to, put, he has to choose which one to put on his ledger. He can't put both of them on, but he should put at least one on. So this is, if we put both of them on, we'll be violating the ledger's no overspending rule. So this is effectively a form of double spending if you put both of these on. So how do you solve how do you solve this distribution problem, this distributed system that requires people to order these events in a certain way that might not be the same ordering for everyone? So we need a way to trust the ledger. The way that Bitcoin does it, and the way that a lot of other cryptocurrencies have done it, is by producing things called blocks. Here's how that works. Let's say you have a bunch of different transactions that you'd like to add to the ledger, but haven't yet. You haven't yet added these to your ledger. What you're gonna do is just pick some ordering of those transactions. It doesn't matter what the ordering is as long as it's valid, as long as it conforms to all the other rules. You just pick some ordering of the transactions. Then you put those in a record set that we'll call a block. And then you say, <clears throat> okay, this is the block that everybody should use. This is the right ordering. Everyone should use my ordering. Well, why should you trust that ordering over any other ordering? Well, the way that Bitcoin does it is with something called proof of work. We're going to ask every person who makes blocks or proposes blocks to sign their block in a particular way. They're going to sign that message that's comprised of the signatures, uh, sorry, the, the transactions that are in the block, and we're going to ask them to come up with a magic number called the nonce. And it turns out that, mm -mm, you know, that's gonna generate some signature. We're gonna produce some string of zeros and ones. Now, what if I told you that I found a signature that started with a single zero. So just one zero. How surprising would that be? Not very surprising because about one in every two signatures have that property. So that's not very surprising. What if I told you I found a signature with two leading zeros? Well, that's a little bit more surprising. Only one of every four signatures have that property. If I told you I found one with four zeros, that would be even more surprising. And if I told you I found one with 30 zeros, that would be very surprising, because remember, we don't know how to generate a specific signature, right? There's no way to generate a specific signature. There's only, um, the only way to generate a specific signature is to try lots and lots of different possibilities. 
So if we can find something that has a lot of leading zeros, that proves to everyone else on the network that we did a lot of work to come up with that, uh, to come up with that magic number n. So if I add my signature that I found that has a lot of leading zeros, and I add the magic number that generates that signature, then I can send that out to everyone on the network and say, hey, you should trust my version of reality. This ordering is, I'm participating in this network, I'm investing work to make this real. You should trust my ordering over somebody else who hasn't put in the work. And in exchange for doing that, the network rewards the people who makes these blocks with a special magic transaction that says, hey, Dave, the person who made that block, we're going to give you 50 lock bucks for helping to organize the network and get things sorted out. So that's a creation of lock bucks that didn't exist before. That's how Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies in general that use proof of work, that's how they make new currency. So that activity is called mining. Uh, and why should you pick some transactions over others? Well, you can also attach a transaction fee to each transaction and then have that be picked up by the people who are putting it in blocks. So the blocks, the transactions that have the highest transaction fees associated with them, those are the ones that are more likely to wind up in blocks. They'll get picked off the, uh, picked off the pile first. And then, so we could take all that, and then if we combine the signature of the previous block we've seen in the network, and we have a lot of these blocks, we can connect them by taking the signature of the last block and putting it in our own block. This makes a chain of blocks that goes all the way back to the very first one, an unbroken chain of blocks or a blockchain. And so if we trust the longest chain that we see, we'll know that we're trusting the chain that has the most consensus around it, the, the one that's done the most work. So if you see a block and then you see another block, and then you see two blocks come in at the same time, you're not sure which one to trust yet, but, but eventually one of these side chains will win, and then that's the one that you wind up trusting because an attacker won't be able to produce blocks quickly enough to catch up with everybody else. So if you're building distributed applications like this, you want to think about the, the proposition I said at the beginning. Is, is all of what we described useful to your application? In particular, can you wait a long time for that consensus to occur? It takes a lot of computational effort to come up with those blocks using a proof of work based system. So if you're using that approach for your blockchain, then you have to wait for the network to arrive at consensus. With Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies, we're talking about something that's not on the order of milliseconds or seconds, but we're talking about something that's on the order of dozens of seconds or even minutes. Are you willing to wait for, are you willing to wait for that amount of time? Second, is this better for you than a database? Is a database actually just going to be an improvement on the blockchain for you? Or is the blockchain just a worse, slower, more distributed form of a database that could just be centralized? And then finally, does that app need to be distributed? Does it really need to be something that everybody has a copy of? Or can it be something that's centralized and that people go to a website to find? And lastly, do you need to trust other people? If you don't need to trust other people, you don't necessarily need to know where the, um, you don't necessarily need to know where the, uh, the wh where, where that application is located or who's using it. So ultimately, you don't necessarily need to trust the other people that are using the, applica the application or the blockchain. So I wanna leave you with uh, four takeaways. First, Blockchain applications are about trustless, permissionless rules. If you're building a blockchain application, you need it to be something that's about, that's about it doesn't require trust. Uh, if you do require trust because you want people to go to some central location to trust the data or the records that you're storing there, blockchains probably aren't a good fit. Cryptocurrencies let us trustlessly exchange value and information with each other, and that's useful, but that may not be as useful as just having a database. And a lot of the protocols that we talked about before, that even that very elementary protocol has some serious problems with it. You have to wait a long time for your blocks to get created. You have to spend a lot of computational effort to come up with an answer and so on. So if you have a protocol, you're basically trusting that your version of software is going to be better than uh, an alternative. So I think blockchains have a lot of potential to drive improvements in how we do this, but there's a really open question about whether or not software is the right way to manifest that. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. And if you uh, have questions, I'd love to answer them on Twitter or afterwards during the break. Thank you very much.